Uh, my name is, is Jason Riley. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and I wanted to welcome you all to what I expect will be a very vibrant and informed uh, discussion uh, this evening of affirmative action in higher education. Uh, this is obviously a very timely topic. The Supreme Court has an opportunity to settle an issue uh, that it's been skillfully ducking for decades, uh, I believe. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a hard call. Um, as I see it, affirmative action is a misguided attempt to reconcile the equal treatment of individuals with preferences for certain groups. And I think those two things are fundamentally irreconcilable, uh, at least if the plain language of the Constitution is any guide or the plain language of the various federal uh, statutes that we have in place or any guide um, and mean what they actually say. And I'm hoping that we finally have a majority on the court today um, who can read, uh, which I don't think is, uh, is too much to ask for. Uh, tonight's discussion will focus primarily on the legality of affirmative action, and rightly so. But uh, there are some other aspects of this debate that I think we should uh, keep in mind uh, as, the, as the evening progresses. Aside from those legal questions, there's also the question of whether these policies are prudent. Uh, we are an increasingly pluralistic society. Uh, the fastest growing groups are not Blacks or whites, they're Asians and Hispanics. Uh, intermarriage rates are climbing rapidly in this country. Um, uh, do we really want to continue what is essentially a racial and ethnic spoil system in uh, a country such as ours that's becoming more and more diverse? Is that wise? Um, large majorities of Americans, by the way, including majorities of whites and blacks and Hispanics and Asians, tell pollsters that they oppose affirmative action in college admissions. Um, the court, therefore, has a chance to do something that is not only uh, the correct thing to do, in my view, but that also has the potential to be quite popular as well. Uh, and finally, there's the question of whether these policies have worked as intended, um, which is something that is often assumed but rarely tested empirically. Uh, we are a half century into the affirmative action era. Uh, racial preferences were sold as uh, in the name of helping the black poor in particular, um, helping to increase the ranks of the black middle class. But after California, our largest state by population ended race-based college admissions in the mid 1990s, black graduation rates rose and they rose significantly. In other words, we may have fewer black professionals today, fewer doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects than we would have had in the absence of racial preferences. So in addition to the dubious legality of these policies, in addition to the increasing divisiveness of racial preferences, there's also a serious question about whether they actually work or whether however well-intentioned, they've turned out to be counterproductive in practice. So I'm gonna stop there because uh, these are the folks you you came to see, and I'm gonna turn things over to my trusted colleague, uh, Ralph Mangwell, who is uh, also, by the way, you should know, uh, a new father for the second time and hasn't been getting a lot of sleep these days. So please cut him some slack. Ralph is also a senior fellow here at MI, and Ralph is going to lead a discussion with Weiwa Chen, uh, Dennis Safran, and Edward Bloom. Uh, Ms. Chen is an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute and president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. Uh, which is an education advocacy group that she also founded. Uh, Mr. Safran is a New York-based attorney who has uh, submitted amicus briefs in support of plaintiffs in the Supreme Court case against Harvard, uh, which is one of the cases we'll be discussing. And Mr. Bloom is the architect of, of that case. He is the founder and president of Students for Fair Admissions, which has challenged admissions policies not only at Harvard, but also at Yale, uh, University of North Carolina, and the University of Texas. And with that, I will, I will turn things over to Ralph. Thank you. Well, thank you. 
Thank you, Jason, for that wonderful introduction of this panel. Thank you all for coming. Again, my name is Rafael Mengual. Um, I'm very excited to moderate this panel. Um, but before I get to our panelists, I think it may be worth me kind of setting the stage a little bit with respect to where things stand legally on the issue of affirmative action. Um, so this is an issue that the Supreme Court has confronted uh, directly three times over the last several decades. In 1978, the court decided a case, Regents of University of California versus Baki, uh, which in involved alleged discrimination against a white medical school applicant by the University of California at Davis. In that case, the court upheld what it called a remedial use of race uh, as a factor in admissions criteria, while also striking down a separate quote unquote special admissions program uh, that was administered by mostly minority committee members um, that was set aside exclusively for members of minority groups. There was, however, no majority in that case as to the rationale for those holdings, which kind of left the issue very much a live one. Um, but the court didn't take it up again until 2003 when it decided a case called Grutter v. Bollinger, uh, in which a white applicant to the law school at the University of Michigan challenged the practice of affirmative action there. Once again, a slim 5-4 majority of the court upheld the practice, um, citing the building of a diverse student body as a compelling state interest. However, the majority in Grutter did, unlike uh, the majority in Baki, provide more guidance for lower courts, particularly by defining some potentially meaningful limits on the practice of affirmative action. For example, a race-conscious admissions program has to be narrowly tailored to a compelling diversity interest, and it cannot, quote, insulate applicants who belong to certain racial or ethnic groups from the competition for admission, end quote. In a companion case called Gratz, the court invalidated a system in which um, points were awarded towards an admission score uh, for members of a particular minority group. Uh, and then, of course, the Supreme Court took the issue up again uh, 10 years later in 2013 in a case called Fisher. Uh, the, case, the court kind of punted the issue by remanding the case for further proceedings uh, on, on procedural grounds. Uh, but the case made its way back up to the Supreme Court again in 2016. Um, and many expected that the court was actually going to rule the practice unconstitutional constitutional, but after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia, whose seat was vacant when uh, the case was decided, the result in that instance was a 4-4 split, which left the University of Texas's system in place pursuant to the rulings of the Court of Appeals. So now, with the Scalia seat filled and two new generally conservative uh, justices on the court, there are two, uh, at least two, new affirmative action cases under consideration. One challenges admissions practices at Harvard University under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. The other challenges admissions practices at the University of North Carolina. Those cases were brought by a group called Students for Fair Admissions and is headed up by Mr. Bloom, to whom I'd like to direct the first question, which is, can you just tell us a little bit about what makes these two cases different from Baki and Grutter slash Gratz? And, you know, what, what are some of the important distinctions we should be keeping an eye of? How, what made you bring these cases? How did they come about? What's, you know, uh, what's, what's kind of going on here for, for people who maybe aren't familiar with the issue? So let me, I promise not to take you into the bones in the ground like a Michener novel, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's start with, I think, the, the most important date um, that I look back on that was the catalyst for what's going on today. And that date was June the 23rd, 2003. I was in the Supreme Court. Um, at the time that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor read her opinion in uh, Grutter versus Bollinger, it was a it was a very disappointing um, moment, um, not only for me but for my colleagues who were there. Um, it was a joyous moment for others, but um, uh, something unusual happened that afternoon. The very afternoon that the court ruled in Grutter and, and Graz, um, uh, Bill, I believe his name was Cunningham, um, uh, President William Cunningham of uh, the University of Texas uh, at Austin um, issued a press release in the name of the university. And that press release stated that going forward, the University of Texas would now reintroduce, not reintroduce, the use of race and ethnicity as a factor in the University of Texas's admissions policies. 
whoa, wait a minute. Now, how did that happen? Why were they, why were they not using affirmative action? Well, a case out of the Fifth Circuit called Hopwood versus Texas back in the 1990s uh, forbid the University of Texas from using race in their undergraduate admissions policies. So here we've got one circuit that has forbidden the use of race and ethnicity in, in college admissions. Um, in response to that, George W. Bush, and I'm a, I'm a Texan, lived there 40 years, George W. Bush uh, and the Texas legislature introduced something called the top 10% plan because uh, African-American and Hispanic enrollment after Hopwood plummeted at the University of Texas. Now with this new legislation, any student graduating in the top 10% of his high school class would automatically be admitted to the University of Texas, regardless of any other uh, SATs, or GPAs, AP classes, you're in. Okay, now when you look at the Gruder and Gratz opinion that we found so devastating, one of the things that, uh, that came out of that opinion was that it was quite clear uh, you could use race, but uh, you had to, a college had to explore and pursue the use of race neutral alternatives to create a diverse student body before you start categorizing people and giving them preferences based upon their race and ethnicity. So wait a minute. UT can't do that. Didn't they read the opinion before they put out the press release? They had a, a, a successful race neutral policy in place, a policy that actually created greater African American and Hispanic enrollment at the University of Texas than did affirmative action prior. So that was the beginning of something called Fisher versus University of Texas. I think a lot of us looked at what UT did and decided that they were vulnerable for an attack. Uh, it took me three years, uh, maybe a little more to find Abigail Fisher. Um, uh, she was a, uh, a high school student. I knew her parents. Uh, she graduated in the 11th percentile of her high school class. So she didn't automatically get into the University of Texas. So she applied to UT outside of the top 10% plan, and she was denied admission. Um, she was eager to sue. We did. Uh, and in 2008, um, Abigail Fisher sued the University of Texas in a case styled Fisher versus the University of Texas. The first time it went up to the Supreme Court, uh, people didn't pay very close attention to that case because it was a seven to one opinion in favor of Abigail Fisher. Justice Kennedy wrote that opinion in which he then remanded the case back because he did something that is kind of in the legal weeds and people don't talk about this much. He raised the bar for um, the standard of review on the use of race and ethnicity in college admissions. Everybody just remembers, oh, it was seven to one. Elena Kagan was recused. It set back. They punted. But without that opinion, without the raising of the bar, students for fair admissions never would have been born. It was that new higher standard of review that uh, led me and a legal team to decide that we were going to um, challenge Harvard uh, uh, based upon based upon their uh, treatment of uh, Asian American applicants and challenge not only Harvard, the oldest private university in the country, but we also challenged the same day the oldest public university in the country, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So that's how these cases um, came to be. I think I have actually taken you into the the bones in the ground on that explanation, but I thought it might be <laughs> no, no, it's a, a, a little more. It's a wonderful <laughs> explanation. It's a, it's a great segue uh, to Dennis, who I want to ask uh, the next question of, because you actually filed an amicus brief at the cert stage of the Harvard case. And for the non-lawyers in the room, 
uh, uh, cert stage just refers to the stage at which the court is deciding whether or not to take up the case. Uh, then there's the merit stage in which the court is actually deciding how it's going to rule. And as I understand it, you're going to be filing a case at the uh, uh, an amicus yes. brief at the merit stage as well. So, I mean, is there something about the facts of this case or the legal posture of this issue um, that's different from, say, the Grutter case, that's different from the Bakke era, you know, besides, I mean, we've already heard about the different standard of review. So, of course, the, you know, Supreme Court has differing levels of scrutiny that it will apply to cases depending on the nature of the case. Um, as was just mentioned, in cases involving race and constitutional questions, the standard of review is going to be strict scrutiny, which is basically the highest bar. And then the Supreme Court has to find that the government has a compelling state interest and that the policy is narrowly tailored to service of that interest. And one of the ways that you assess narrow tailoring, as was discussed, is you, you look at whether or not alternatives had been tried before that could have gotten you to the same result without actually implicating uh, the constitutional issue. And so, you know, Beyond beyond that, is there something that's that's different that highlights a particular path to victory here? I mean, I know you know after Harvard is a private university, unlike the public universities that have been challenged. Uh, there's there's obviously a difference in sort of the nature of the plaintiffs in this case. I wonder if you could just give us a little bit about it. Yeah, there <clears throat> there are two interrelated factors that make the Harvard case in in particular um, a. Uh, a compelling vehicle that, that I think um, shines a light on, on the problems with affirmative action. Um, and I've the cases are now consolidated, and I put in briefs for the National Asso Association of Scholars at both in both the UNC yeah. and Harvard cases. Um, and now it'll be one brief on both cases. But what the Harvard case in particular highlights is. Um, First of all, that it focuses on discrimination, not just against the white majority, you know, sort of a reverse discrimination, but against Asian Americans. And there are um, studies um, at both Harvard um, that came out in this case and at other elite colleges that show, shockingly, that uh, up to 80 percent of the... <coughs> set asides for racial preferences for so-called underrepresented minorities actually come not from the white majority, but from another historically marginalized racial minority from Asian Americans. Um, now, yes, how could that be? Because whites are obviously still the majority of applicants, even at, even at these very top schools that have lots of Asian applicants. Um, and there's no reason to think that Asians cluster toward the bottom of the applicant pool. Indeed, all the evidence shows just the reverse, that, you know, even at a place like, like Harvard, Stanford, they cluster toward the top. So you would expect at the very least that, that whites would suffer a, um, a proportionate burden. Um, and yet the evidence indicates that they don't, that most of this comes... Uh, um, Four, up to four out of five spaces that are lost come from Asian Americans. Um, what suggests itself, ironically, is that you could have um, so-called implicit um, bias going on here. That's a big theory on, on the left. It's, it's often a bogus theory, but insofar as it has some kernel of truth, um, there does seem to be something going on in admissions offices where when it has to be decided who's going to give up their seat in the name of racial diversity, that admissions officers are falling back on the old stereotypes of, of Asians as, you know, bland, boring, test robots, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, before we had a, a multicultural society, there may have been other biases going on, I'm sure there were, that were more class-based, that we always knew that affirmative action um, <clears throat> hurt not the affluent whites, not the Kennedys, but the working class whites. Uh, but now we have a very achievement oriented minority that has um, that has these negative stereotypes. And the most likely hypothesis of why you have this this very striking result is that there is implicit bias uh, against Asians that's being tapped. 
Now, the related factor that makes Harvard significant is in uh, in the Bakke case, Justice Powell had his swing opinion there. He specifically cited and appended to his, his decision Harvard's plan. Harvard did put in with other top colleges an amicus brief, and they appended their so-called holistic admissions plan, and Justice Powell cited that in saying that, that the diversity was the only compelling interest that could justify racial preferences. He said, just like Harvard's plan, uh, this is the right way to do it. Uh, race is just a plus, so-called plus factor. And then the Grutter Court, 25 years later, that made Powell's opinion the law, that clearly for the first time made Powell's opinion the law of the land, again cited the Harvard admissions plan. But in point of fact, that admissions plan, um, Harvard went over to holistic admissions in the 1920s, uh, and it did so expressly to exclude Jews uh, who were stereotyped in much the same way as Asian Americans are today, as, as a, you know, grubby, overachieving uh, minority that got too big, too big for their britches and had achieved too much under the old academic standards. And the language, it's hard for us to believe now, but if you go through this history, the explicit anti-Semitism from Harvard President A. Lawrence Lowell is just, is just eye-popping. And he was quite honest that the uh, he was going over to subjective standards focused not so much on academic uh, achievement and tests as on character and leadership. He was doing it because it was the only way he knew to exclude Jews. So the whole premise for affirmative action in Bakke and Greta was, was really based on a lie. And so and a, on a lie that now... Um, punishes Asian Americans in the same way it once punished Jews. So that's what makes this case a, you know, a particular vehicle for challenging affirmative action. Yeah, I mean, I when I was looking at some of the uh, uh, amicus briefs in the case and, and some of the evidence that had been brought to light about just how much better Asian Americans have to perform on standardized yeah. exams to have the same chance of admission as you know, one of their uh, 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 counterparts from a preferred minority group, um, it was really, really uh, astounding to me. And it, it seemed to be like Harvard in particular was relying heavily on this sort of personality score part of the assessment. And I think that does really lean into this idea of implicit bias being at play. Um, and, and so wait, wait, at a moment in which authorities here in New York City have upended admissions practices for specialized high schools, in which um, uh, gifted and talented programs have been uh, under close scrutiny, all because of alleged overrepresentation of Asian Americans, uh, per, you know, per, compared to their part of the city population. You also have uh, hate crimes against the Asian community uh, on the rise. I mean, what when you hear some of this evidence, when you see what comes out of these cases, I mean, what what is the perception that's being fed in the Asian American community? I mean, to what degree? Um, do we get to a point at which you can't help but feel embattled because, you know, just outstanding achievement has it has been sort of the norm in a lot of ways, and then the the, the sort of goalposts keep getting moved and moved and moved. I, I agree with you completely here that there's a problem, and and I have to thank also the members over here, especially Edward, for all of his work here, and you with your amicus briefs. Right. Who, there's been a lot of work by a lot of people who have cared deeply about the cr critical, critical problems that we address as face as a nation. Um, and you use a couple of terms. It's not implicit bias, okay? <laughs> right. It's explicit <laughs> bias. <laughs> and, and I when, want it to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when we talk about uh, overrepresented and underrepresented, a kid comes in and he doesn't represent all of these other kids. You know, they're not like I'm representing all of the white kids. Uh, <laughs> uh, when this kid goes and gets a job, he's going to get it for himself and maybe his family, but he's not representing, he's not gonna share it back with everybody. I mean, in a general way, we do want him to do that. But 
so I think this notion of overrepresenting, you know, when you say that somebody is underrepresented group, then that implies that somebody's over. And that's already wrong to say because nobody's overrepresented. You are going to be represented by your merit, by your achievement, your abilities. And that's something that we have to remember that is the most important thing. When we start judging people by something that they really can't control, something like race, uh, that is something that will hurt everybody in society. Uh, and the hate crimes here. When you talk about Asian hate, the real hate here is in something that is happening in our institutions. That's what's systemic. So if you want to talk about something that's institutionalized, what's happening on the street there comes from what's happening in the schoolrooms when the Asians are told, you don't belong here. You know, that's the kind of thing that they're telling you one, with one way or another way. That's the real message and everybody sees it. And that's exactly the same thing that the thugs are saying. And you'll see that in the press reports when they say, you don't belong here and they slug somebody, okay? That's not based on the individual merit of that person who has suffered that crime. It's a crime. And so we don't want to get into all of this, you know, Asian hate or you know, is this a hate crime or not? Is it less so or more so of a crime because somebody didn't say a word or slur? I think that we have to step back and say, if we care about this kind of prejudice and bias, we have to stop it right at where the selection happens in the elementary schools, in the middle schools, in the high schools, and in college. Because that actually trickles down further. You know, that goes into your jobs, your board representations, when we have to start defining everything by the metrics of, do you have enough? Now we're going to start saying, are you dark enough? Are you light enough? You know, what's the measure of that? Are, are we going to start determining and having a little monitor to say, you know, this amount of darkness is right, that amount <laughs> is not? This gets to the absurdity. So I think that we have to focus on the merit of each individual, because if we do not do that, we will commit gross injustices. And as a society, when you judge as a group, when you have social justice, you do not have justice. Because this kind of group um, ostracization or rewards, you cannot be judged or positively or negatively based on that. And that is what this battle is about. It doesn't happen to be um, always the case that it was Asians, as you both talked about it. This was a case of the Jews being first ostracized. It could be another group later. So we have to stay with the principles. What we do here, what we're fighting for here, is the same thing for every other generation. The same reason that in New York we fought for the specialized high schools to be just completely merit-based. You take the test. And it doesn't matter what you look like, whether your parents are rich, poor, or what their professions are, that's what's the most important thing about your individual abilities. I think that was very well said. Um, you know, there, there was a time in which objective measures of, of merit were seen as a way to combat uh, racism and prejudice and, and bias, particularly uh, on college campuses, because you couldn't, you couldn't cheat the test, right? Either you passed or you didn't. Either you performed above a certain threshold or you didn't. Um, and, and I think Weiwa makes a, a really compelling case for just what the evil of affirmative action actually looks and feels like. And to, to some degree, this is recognized in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, right? There's there's a little line in, in, in the, the Grutter case, I, I'm going to direct this question to you, Edward, where there's the, it's implied that this is just a necessary evil that we need to engage in for just a little bit longer until we get to this point. And so one of the questions is, you know, when do we get to that point? Uh, you know, how do how do we know? Does, does the Supreme Court know? Is there any way to actually hold them to that promise that this is a temporary suspension of of norms that we've gotten away from? Um, probably not. I think. Um, in, by the way, Justice O'Connor isn't the only one that thought that there should be a, a time limit on this. Right. During the last seven years of, of litigation with Harvard specifically. Um, their new their new president, uh, President uh, uh, Larry Bacow, has said um, that these policies he, he, 
he said it more artfully than I'm about to say it, but he said the, the time will come when we don't have to do this, that there, there, is, a, there is a limit according to President Bacow. And I know his heart is in the right place. I'm not at war with Harvard. Uh, I'm not at war with, with, with the Board of Overseers, but um, we recognize that what is happening, the policies are, are wrong. Now, uh, I think what the hope of President Bacow and the hope of Justice O'Connor was that sooner or later, the uh, admissions, uh, the merit, meritocratic admissions policies at colleges and universities will actually mirror the, the general population, that uh, African Americans and Hispanics and Asians will, will, will be in about the same percentage as an incoming freshman class at Harvard and other places as they are in the general population. Well, that, that is not really the way the law works. Uh, the law is very geometric, um, and um, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the Supreme Court is going to be persuaded that um, the, the case is presented before it, uh, maybe five or six years before Justice O'Connor's uh, time limit. That's a, you, know, you, you raise a really interesting point because there's this idea implicit in the way that these admissions programs are set up that there is something meaningful to group identity based on race or ethnicity. And if you take the, the idea of, of group identity seriously, and this is a point that, that Glenn Lowry has made, I think, really, really well, then it naturally follows from that that groups are going to have different uh, interests different uh, mores, and that is going to manifest itself in different outcomes. And, you know, uh, uh, Wei, I want to ask you that, I mean, is, do you think that that's, that that's right? Have they sort of failed, have the proponents of affirmative action kind of failed to follow the logic of this idea that there is something meaningful to group identity that makes life for other students on campus differently? And, and, and is that idea wrong? Is, is the day-to-day -day life of the average college student genuinely and truly enriched simply by having someone living on their dorm room floor who is of group X? Well, actually, um, it's a little bit demeaning, first of all, to say that you need to have a certain kind of person next to you just as a token individual around you. You know, you've got to have that token Asian, token cowboy token, black, you know, whatever. This is kind of absurd, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, and not only that, if we believe in the notion of diversity, you're going to have to accept that people of different groups may have different interests. And in fact, if we believe in uh, even families, uh, when we look even within a family, you'll know that there are kids, siblings, who are with the same general genes nature and nurture is going to be pretty similar and they're going to come out very different. They are not actually equal. They may be very uh, interested in the same things uh, in certain cases, but in other cases, they're very, very different. And so it really will have to go back to saying, what do you do with these kids? You have to go and see how do they interact if they can bring something to the party, all right? Beyond their race, then it does something. And, and I wonder, Dennis, if we ever really get to a point of satisfaction, because I can see a world in which maybe the general uh, uh, sort of a body of a freshman class in an undergraduate institution uh, somehow gets to a point where every sort of racial group is, is represented in proportion to their part of the population. Um, but does it stop there, right? I mean, I can see a, a situation in which, well, now you look at engineering majors and, hey, there's a, a disproportionality in, among engineering right. majors or hey, there's a disproportionality yeah. among art history majors. And, you know, I, I, at what point do we get to uh, the absurdity of the whole project? Yeah, and there was an inherent contradiction. Justice O'Connor, in her better opinion, said 20, 25 years was the timetable. Uh, but coming up on that, give it, we are <laughs> six years away. Um, <clears throat> but given that way back in, in Bakke, they had, and, and this should be stressed, a lot of people don't realize because we still fight about affirmative action for redressing, you know, past discrimination. The court majority ruled against that in Bakke, said that was not a legitimate basis for racial preferences, redressing past grievances. Only the, quote, educational benefits of a diverse 
student body. That's when diversity became such a big buzzword. Um, but then if, if it's diversity, um, rather than redressing past grievances, that's your goal. Why do we ever get to that? Um, well, it was, as Edward said, citing Vic Howe, in theory, um, you could get to a point where you have exact, you know, Harvard's admissions have to exactly reflect the population, but they never, they never have. It'd be interesting. Though I can't find studies of this to see, you know, what's the proportion of Italian Americans uh, at Harvard versus in the population. Um, and then even if we could find it's all exactly equal, as Ralph said, then we'd start talking about the, uh, the engineering majors. Um, and I think O'Connor almost mid-sentence recognized that uh, distinction. If you read her actual sentence, she kind of stops and says, we think there'll be a, uh, an end point in 25 years when this will no longer be necessary to um, sustain the compelling interest we uphold today. So I, I think she realized that contradiction, but it, it's a problem and it's kind of like a poison pill in some ways, even though the court back in Baki probably took the more moderate uh, approach by rejecting the idea that we can do this just to redress past grievances, um, the diversity rationale actually stuck in a poison pill that could keep it going in, in perpetuity. I think that's right. So uh, as much as I'd like to sit here for the next three hours yeah. and continue this conversation, I want to get the audience uh, involved here. I'm sure you all have questions. So I think we have a microphone uh, going around uh, from Noah there. So if you just raise your hand, I think we'll start here in front, gentlemen in the blue suit. Um, and just, you know, so tell us, <laughs> just tell us who you are um, and uh, ask your question. I do ask that you make it a question and not a small speech. <laughs> um, great. It may not be on, so just project. <laughs> I will project. Uh, so basically, uh, my question is, there we go. ah, there, I have a new life. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, so uh, regarding, uh, we've been discussing, obviously, um, uh, higher education admissions. Why are we limiting it to that? What about 8A set-asides? What about, uh, you know, why does... Why do government contractors have to keep track of the racial composition of their workforces? I mean, I'm talking about people like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, all the NASA contractors. I, I work in the aerospace field. Uh, um, it seems to me that we're, we're shooting low. I mean, we, we need to... None of this seems reconciled with the 14th Amendment. Well, of course, it's also not just the 14th Amendment, right? There is uh, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, but Dennis, do you want to take a crack at this one? Um, in some respects, the, the court has um, made it harder. Uh, they, they've allowed the greatest leeway in um, higher education um, than in, uh, like, set aside programs. I know it may not seem that way, but they have uh, they have imposed more limits on that. But I do agree philosophically it's it's a problem whether we're talking about higher education or whether we're talking about who gets government contracts, it's it's stigmatizing. Um, it's stigmatizing. The, the only thing worse than actual, oppression of a group as was you know obviously done to african americans and slavery and for 100 years thereafter but the only thing worse than that is to set us is to take everyone in any particular group it could be african americans it could be chinese americans jewish americans italian americans and, and raise everyone up one or two levels um you have everyone uh, you create this we all have an imposter syndrome, but if you're if you know you've been raised up two levels, think about how much worse that imposter syndrome is, and then you wind up compensating for that by becoming even more militant. Um, I I think it's terrible to to the group itself, um, and 
you know, as, as Jason said, it's not probably not doing any good, certainly in higher education for various reasons. We find that in California, the black graduation rate went up after racial preferences were banned. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but, but philosophically, I certainly think we've got to move out of the whole racial preferences across the board. Anything anyone else wants to add before we're moving on? I'll just add something sure. very short. It, it, is, it is my hope, and I think it's been discussed within kind of the conservative legal community, that this case is going to be um, something more than just about admissions, that uh, the court has the opportunity here to give a roadmap for future litigation within employment, within contracting, within um, kind of the whole reparations, um, uh, diversity uh, driven uh, decision making in the private sector and the public sector. So I'm hopeful that not only will we end the use of race and ethnicity in college admissions, but uh, the, the court will, will kind of shine a light on, on where uh, uh, litigation should go to narrow what you've just described. I'd like to say just quickly here, that uh, when we look at the uh, injustice that you talked about, you know, 100 years ago, what happened there, we have to be very careful about appropriating other people's grievances. So I think that if you take other people's ancestors' grievances and say that they apply to me, that's actually robbing somebody else's actual grievances. So we have to stand on what's happening here, and that comes to the merit. The other thing is that I want people to understand also for some of you who have not heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act, a lot of people mention it because they say, oh, here's the awful thing that happened. Okay, it, it was not a good thing that happened, but there are a couple of things that a lot of people don't see. One is that it happened because of somewhat similar things that are happening now. It's because the Chinese worked too well Okay, the Chinese Exclusion Act happened because they did such good work, they uh, depressed the, the wages, and that actually is somewhat similar to some of the things that are happening now on the exclusion side. And so we should look at it from that perspective and say that we don't want that to be the driving factor because it changes everything from merit and hurts the entire global economy. And history does tend to repeat itself, Mr. Gilman. In terms of the higher education, there is a institution in California, Caltech, yep. that uses no racial or other classification or pluses. Has that come to play in any of the amicus arguments put forth? Is the court going to consider the results there, which obviously has a higher proportion of Asians than any of the other elite non-California institutions? By, by far, it does. there is a tremendous chart. And, and there's an article that really sort of um, launched this whole movement that was done by Ron Ons, who, you know, has, has since developed a kind of mixed reputation, but a very, very bright guy, wrote a long, uh, we'll leave it at that, uh, <laughs> wrote a very long article in the American Conservative back in 2012. Um, the uh, the problems with meritocracy, I think, or something like that. But he went through the discrimination against uh, Asian Americans, specifically at Harvard, but also at the other colleges. And he has one chart that shows, um, it charts every elite, the Ivies and two or three others like Stanford, elite colleges, um, you know, Asian percentage, uh, then another line is the increase in uh, the percentage of the youth cohort uh, that was Asian, given that you have the immigration reform of 1965. And then there's Caltech. So the Caltech line moves up uh, basically in tandem with the Asian population to where it gets to 42% at, at, in 2010, which was the end of uh, UNS's data period. Um, the others look like 
um, one of those either electrical charts or nerve charts where all the all the strands come together in a coil, uh, what antitrust lawyers call conscious parallelism. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a, there's not an antitrust claim in this case, but it's amazing to see, you know, Harvard and Stanford and you, you Chicago and Duke and Columbia, they all come together at about 16% um, just year after year after year. So there's a very clear uh, difference at Caltech. And and the fact that they come together at 16% is all, yeah. also risks uh, uh, looking a lot like a quota. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll just yeah. add one, one, a couple of sort of data points. Uh, 1993, 1993, Harvard uh, Asian admission uh, percentages, about 20%. Uh, 10 years later, it had dropped to um, about 16.4 percent. Ten years after that, um, the year that students with your admissions sued Harvard, the the admissions rate was still about 17 percent. So over a 20-year period in which, as Dennis mentioned, Asian American uh, 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 application rates have gone up dramatically, um, uh, the, the, it, the, the admissions rate at Harvard has been flatlined. Since we filed this lawsuit, however, over the last uh, seven yeah. years, seven years, uh, Harvard's uh, Asian American uh, uh, admission rates are now uh, up to 29%. Over a seven year period, over a seven year period, uh, they have gone up 60%. Now, to me, well, I'm, I'm glad, but what does that tell us about what Harvard has been doing? for the prior 20 years and why now don't you think the justices are going to look at this and go wait a minute you're filling in a pothole after people have fallen in and broken their ankles you can't do that harvard and edward you should also mention what led to that smaller uptick back 30 years ago in, in uh, uh, right before 1993. Well, that was a that was a uh, an investigation um, by the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education into uh, Harvard's treatment of Asian Americans as, as well. So, lots of interesting off, data. The case was when that case was closed by the Bush. It was in the Reagan administration. It was closed in the Bush one administration, and that's when suddenly it goes back down and flat lines. We have a question from this young woman in black right here. Uh, keep going. Uh, yep, stand up back there. Blonde highlights, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so if this sounds like a very naive question, please move on. But I I don't understand how it is that the Supreme Court can tell a private bakery that they have to bake a cake for whoever they want and they can't discriminate against a client. <laughs> But yet, in, you know, institutions of learning can. How is that possible? So, <laughs> like from a legal perspective, like how uh, how does the court see those things as different? Because uh, I don't I don't understand. So I'll I'll take a, a just a quick crack just to set uh, one of the other uh, uh, lawyers on the panel uh, up here. But uh, I think it has a little something to do with federal dollars and and state action. Um, but but Dennis, you can kind of. It should cut the other way. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not at all a dumb, naive question. It drives me crazy. Um, now, fortunately, they have, um, they kind of punted on the baking the cake case. They did rule for the baker, uh, but only on these very narrow grounds that they found explicit discrimination. Um, that was also Justice Kennedy who kicked, kicked the can down the road on that. But yeah, it's it's going and it's Harvard. It's institutions like Harvard that get federal funds, not, you know, uh, Jack, what's his name, the, the proprietor of Masterpiece Cake. He doesn't have federal funds, but the entire establishment will say that he's covered by discrimination law and, and Harvard can just sort of blatantly uh, disobey it. I think we have time for one last very, very quick question. Um, I'm trying to get to everybody as freely as I can, but why don't we go here in the middle? There's so many absurdities about these quota systems or whatever they call them. But one part is 
that why have a national criteria? I mean, the state, the demographics of every state is so different. You look at Mississippi, they've got 40% blacks. Utah is like 3% black. The California, the population of the Asians is very different than Harvard. And yet they all apply this national standard, which may not apply at all to those who are applying to their, their schools, because you tend to get from more from regional. I, I suppose that's probably truer for lower tier schools than it might be for, for the really elite institutions that attract a lot of attention from people around the country, regardless of, of, of where they are. But I wonder if anyone else on the panel has uh, something they might want to add to that, which actually brings up a pretty interesting question, because when you have kind of an affirmative action uh, regime, what ends up happening, I think, and, and you all can tell me if I'm wrong here, but uh, sort of... Uh, for lack of a better word, less, uh, lower scoring applicants will kind of get picked up by the more elite schools, which leaves the sort of middle ground schools with much less of an applicant pool um, uh, to pick from. And so you tend to see much wider disparities, I would suspect, say in the University of Michigan case than you would uh, perhaps at Harvard uh, between the average uh, black admin and the average Asian admin. I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah, as we've talked about the Harvard the discrepancies at Harvard, uh, while still uh, shockingly large, are actually much smaller um, than uh, at schools like University of Michigan, because as Ralph said, there are uh, unfortunately so few, you know, black kids who score like 1600 on their SATs that they are they are gobbled up by a handful of the very, very, you know, so-called top institutions like Harvard and Stanford. And then the very worst problems are, are at those still selective prestigious institutions just under the top level, places like maybe Michigan, Notre Dame, because Asian Americans are just the reverse. There's so many <laughs> with 1,600 SATs that, you know, places, and I don't have the actual data at hand, but um, places like Notre Dame are probably chock full of, you know, Asian American kids with 1,600 SATs, but by the time you get there, the African American uh, student body there is is going to be much lower. So that's where the the most glaring discrepancies are. So again, uh, such a fascinating conversation that I really wish we could continue. I want to thank you all for coming and being here and being such an attentive audience. Um, and hopefully, we can uh, continue this at another event. Thank you all. Great job, guys.